Welcome to this series of lectures on magnetic resonance imaging. This lecture will be a hardware overview. Here we'll talk about how and why the scanner makes three magnetic fields, the B0 or main field, the gradient fields for spatial encoding, and the B1 or RF fields. We'll start with the B0 or main field. The job of this field is to generate magnetization. Here's a schematic of an MRI scanner. The geometry of the coils that make the main field, it looks like this. It's a solenoid, makes a magnetic field that goes straight up the bore of the scanner, called B0. This coil makes a magnetic field that's super uniform, down to about one part in 10 to the eighth in the sweet spot of the scanner. The wires that generate these fields are about 10 kilometers of superconducted wire, carrying about 100 amps, sitting in liquid helium at about 4 degrees Kelvin. Now the reason that this main field generates magnetization is as follows. The MRI signal comes from hydrogen nuclei, mostly those in water. The hydrogen nucleus is composed of simply a single proton. The proton has magnetization as shown here. It's characterized by a gyromagnetic ratio. In the presence of an applied magnetic field, the energy states of these protons are split into a high energy and a low energy state much like the needle of a compass is split into a high energy state and a low energy state in the presence of, a, of the Earth's magnetic field, with the high energy state being when the needle is pointing south, the low energy state, which is the preferred state, being the one where the, where the needle is pointing north. In this case, the difference in energy between the two states is given by the gyromagnetic ratio gamma times H times Planck's constant times the main field. This split in energy level causes a difference in population between the number of spins that are in the down state versus the number that are in the up state, and the ratio of those two are given by e to the minus delta e over kt, which is the Boltzmann distribution. The net magnetization is the magnetization of a single proton times the difference in the number between those that are in the up state and those that are in the down state. Now this Boltzmann distribution, when delta e is much smaller than kt as it is in this case, gives you a net magnetization that's proportional to delta e, that's in turn proportional to delta b0, and because the signal is proportional to the net magnetization, we can connect the signal to noise ratio directly to B0. Therefore, the bigger the B0, the better the SNR. So if bigger is better, then what limits the magnetic field that you choose for an MRI scanner? From the technical point of view, that's primarily limited by the amount of energy that's in the main field. You can recall that the energy that's, that's stored in a magnetic field is some constant times the, the integral of B squared over the volume. It also happens to be equal to 1 half L I squared, where L is the inductance and I is the current, but it's easier to calculate. It's easier to calculate from the first form. If you have a three Tesla scanner, and you're you're asking the scanner to produce three Tesla over about one cubic meter, the energy that's sitting in that field is about 3.6 megajoules, which is the amount of energy it takes to lift a 1,000 kilogram car 360 meters up in the air. That's a lot of energy. What the system engineer has to do is to figure out what to do with all that energy in the event of a quench. Normally, the wires that make up the main field are superconducting, which by definition means that the resistance is exactly zero, and no heat is dissipated uh, with those 100 amps of current that's flowing through it. If for any reason any segment of that wire becomes resistive, then heat is dissipated at that point. That boils off the local supply of liquid helium, and that makes the neighboring area resistive. That creates a positive feedback loop that rapidly makes the entire main coil become non-superconducting. The energy ends up going into the boiling of the liquid helium. The heat of vaporization of liquid helium is about 2.5 kilojoules per liter. You do the math, three that 3.6 megajoules of energy into 2.5 kilojoules per liter means that that amount of energy can boil off 1,400 liters of liquid helium. Not coincidentally, that's uh, just about the amount of liquid helium that's in uh, a 3T scanner. When the coil becomes non-superconducting, the resistance goes from zero to about 100 ohms for that 10 kilometers of wire. For 100 amps of current, the power dissipated in that 100 ohms is about a megawatt. So roughly speaking, that 3.6 megajoules dumped at a rate of 1 megawatt can dissipate in about 3.6 seconds. It's slower than that because the current is decreasing as the quench is occurring. But roughly speaking, that 1400 liters of liquid helium is converted into about 1,000 times that about 1.4 million liters of helium gas in a matter of seconds. So the management of the stored energy is one of the main engineering limitations to how high the main field can be. Okay, now moving on to gradient fields. 
The job of the gradient fields are to provide spatial encoding. They do that by modulating the precession frequency and therefore phase of spins differentially or according to position. There are three independently controlled gradient coils and sets of gradient fields. Each of the gradient axes is characterized by the partial derivative of the z component of field with respect to their coordinate. And the reason that the z component of the field is what matters is as follows. The main field is very large, on the order of tens of thousands of gauss, whereas the gradient fields are only on the order of gauss or tens of gauss. Any component of the gradient field that's perpendicular to the main field effectively just creates a slight tilt on the, of the axis of the main field and actually doesn't stretch or shrink the main field vector at all. And therefore, the precession frequency, which is determined by the net field, will be unchanged. However, any component that is in the same direction as the main field, that is by convention in the z direction, will stretch or shrink the main field vector and therefore will create a frequency offset that's given by gamma times the local gradient field. The z direction, which is defined by the direction of the main field, is along the axis of the bore as shown before. For a z gradient coil, the symmetry of the gradient coil windings are as follows. They have the symmetry of two counter-rotating loops, and as you can imagine, the z component of the field that's generated by those loops will have a strong dependence on z. For the x gradient coil, the symmetry of the loops that make up the coil looks something like this. It's a little hard to see in this picture, so let's look at this from the top. I've drawn here only the current elements that are producing the fields of interest. The rest of the loops are just return currents. So here you have four wires all heading in the upward direction, and they generate magnetic fields circulating around them. As you can see, the component of those fields that are in the z direction will have a dependence on x. The y gradient coil has the exact same symmetry as the x gradient coil, but it's just rotated about the axis of the scanner by 90 degrees. Okay, so let's get an idea of how big we would like those gradients to be. So let's say we want to do a scan with 0.2 millimeter spatial resolution. That's very high resolution. And we want to achieve that resolution in about a millisecond because there are some short T2 species that require very fast scanning like that. The Fourier sampling theorem says we need a half a rotation per pixel. So a half a rotation per 0.2 millimeters is our k-space excursion. That equals gamma times the gradient times time. Gamma is about 4 kilohertz per gauss for protons. So for a time of one millisecond, we need a gradient of about 5 gauss per centimeter, which is about what modern systems can produce. Now taking a look at the power it takes to create such a gradient field. If we want to fill a cubic meter with 5 gauss per center gradients, and we want to do that in about 0.2 milliseconds, so we want to ramp up in a time that's short compared to the pulse, the power required is the energy in the field over the time. The energy in the field is again the integral of b squared over the volume. Because it's a gradient field, we need to calculate the RMS value of a 5 gauss per centimeter gradient over that volume. But if you go through that arithmetic, you end up with a number that's about 500 kilowatts, so about a half a megawatt of power to get your gradients going in 200 milliseconds. And this power requirement sets one of the limitations for how fast your gradient system can go. Now, interestingly, there's another more physiological limitation on how fast you can switch gradients. Rapidly switched magnetic fields induce EMFs, and those EMFs can create currents in the body, and those currents can generate peripheral nerve stimulation, which can cause tingling sensations and twitching. So that's not good. So if you've got a 5 gauss per centimeter gradient, at the edges of the body, which are about 20 centimeters away, you have about 100 gauss of magnetic field. If you're generating that in 0.2 milliseconds, the magnetic field slew rate is about 50 tesla per second. And it turns out that physiologically, that 50 te tesla per second is right around the threshold for peripheral nerve stimulation. So it just happens that peripheral nerve stimulation sets thresholds that are just about the same as the current engineering base limits. Okay, so now let's move on to RF fields. RF fields are required in order to rotate the magnetization about any effective field other than along a z-axis, and that's necessary in order to generate transverse magnetization to produce an NMR signal. So let's see how that happens. In the laboratory frame, if you apply a small transverse magnetic field in order to try to tip the magnetization, all that would do is produce a small tip in the net magnetic field, and while that would produce some precessing magnetization, the transverse component of that would be minuscule. So let's go into the rotating frame. In the rotating frame, the z component of the effective field is reduced by the chosen rotating frame frequency over gamma. And the easiest way to see why that is, is that the faster the rotating frame, the slower the apparent precession is in that rotating frame. And that slower rotation is represented by a smaller effective field along the z direction. Now if you chose a rotating frame uh, at the Larmor frequency, then the effective field along the z direction vanishes. And in the absence of any additional applied fields, any magnetization that exists in that particular rotating frame would be stationary. If in that particular rotating frame you apply a transverse magnetic field, then the magnetization will simply rotate around the applied field, and rotation of magnetization away from the z-axis to generate transverse components is straightforward. 
So what that tells you is that the application of transverse magnetic fields applied in the rotating frame at the Larmor frequency are effective in rotating the magnetization away from the z-axis, while transverse magnetic fields in the laboratory frame are not. Okay, so now once you have transverse magnetization, it's easier to think of how that generates detectable NMR signals by transforming back to the laboratory frame. Once you have transverse magnetization in the laboratory frame, that magnetization is actually rotating at the Larmor frequency, producing a rotating magnetic field that can be detected inductively with antennas. So to calculate how big you want the V1 fields to be, the main requirement is that you want to tip magnetization rapidly compared to relaxation processes like T2 and T2 star, which again can be as fast as about a millisecond. So you want the rotation frequency, which is gamma B1, to be about a kilohertz in order to tip things in the millisecond range. And that means that the B1 itself needs to be on the order of 0.1 gauss. The calculation of the power that's required to generate a particular B1 field is much more complicated than it was for uh, both main field and the gradient fields, and that's because the power is dominated not by the interaction between the B1 field and spins, but instead the interaction with the B1 field and the lossy structures of the body. That discussion is beyond the scope of this introduction, and so we'll jump to the answer. And that is that to produce a B1 field of about 0.1 gauss in a human body, you need about 10 kilo watts of RF power. Now the primary limitation to how much power you can apply is the fact that some of that power is actually deposited in the body and converted into heat. And that absorption of power is characterized by something that's called the specific absorption rate. The FDA regulates SAR. And fortunately, the power that's required to perform MRI effectively at the duty cycles that are required for MRI pulse sequences results in temperature rises in the body that are much, much less than one degree. The geometry of the coils that make the B1 fields are very much complementary to those of the gradient coils. In that for gradient coils, the only component of field that matters is the Z component of field. For RF pulses, the only component of the magnetic field that matters is the transverse components. So a typical geometry of an RF coil that produces RF pulses is something like this. And as you can see, the primary magnetic field component that it generates will be transverse. Okay, so this has been an overview of the three field generating components of a magnetic resonance imaging system. The main field to generate magnetization, the RF fields to convert that into visible transverse magnetization, and the gradient fields to provide spatial encoding.